The following review for The Wonderful 101 contains spoilers for the entire game. This includes both the story and some gameplay tricks you may prefer to figure out for yourself. If you haven't played it, then I highly recommend doing so before watching any further. The Wonderful 101 released in 2013 for the Wii U. The game sees a collection of superheroes working together to stop an alien invasion. Wonder Red is the de facto leader of the group and the first one introduced during the tutorial. The tutorial itself undergoes a logical progression. First it shows the player how to move and regroup team members. Then Red fights a battle by himself where the only thing the player can do is press the A button to attack. Only after those two are out of the way does the player perform their first Unite Morph, and the first two weapons have the easiest symbols to draw, a circle and a straight line. If you stop and think about this, this all sounds like an incredibly boring way to start a game with such limited mechanics. It pulls this off though, partially thanks to the high amount of spectacle which can distract from the simplistic gameplay, but mainly because each section of the tutorial is mercifully brief. Right away, the wonderful 101 establishes itself as a game which isn't going to spoon feed the player. The movement tutorial lasts about 20 seconds, the first combat one lasts another 30 or so after that. The player is shown how to recruit new members once, before swiftly moving on to the Unite Morphs. As someone who largely considers tutorials to be the enemy of fun, I was quite happy with this introduction, even if I did struggle a little with the drawing mechanic to begin with. This weapon drawing mechanic is obviously one of the most unique things about the wonderful 101. In fact it's so unique it can be surprisingly confusing at first, even though it's rather simple in retrospect. Being released on the Wii U, this led me to the natural assumption that drawing shapes on the gamepad was the way to go, and that drawing them with the analog stick would be missing the point. This assumption turned out to be wrong, as I quickly found moving my hands off the buttons to be a cumbersome experience. I resorted to the analog stick for the vast majority of shapes from there on out, with no regrets. The only time I went back to drawing on the pad was for the glider sections. Although some shapes can be hard to draw initially, I found I adapted to thinking of them more like fighting game inputs, and they began to click into place once I figured out a particular motion that worked for me. On the surface, this would seem like a massive failure for the game. I mean, why bother implementing a drawing mechanic if the player is just going to end up using the analog stick instead? In the early missions, it's not unreasonable to wonder why the weapon switching wasn't just mapped to a button. In fact, I'd be willing to bet many people who have completed the game still consider this system to be overly convoluted, but let's examine it in depth. It's true that in the early missions the drawing mechanic isn't a particularly valuable function. The player starts with a sword and a fist. Obviously these could be switched through with ease just by pressing a button. But it's not long before the team gets Unite Gun, then Unite Whip, then Unite Hammer. Unite Bomb, Unite Bow, Unite Naginata, Unite Boomerang. Even if we exclude Unite Goggles and a couple other special morphs that can be used on New Game Plus, that's 10 weapons which the player is guaranteed to have by the end of the game. This is the first benefit of the drawing system in the wonderful 101. It allows the player to switch from any weapon to any other weapon without having to go through any in between. If this was the only benefit, then some kind of wheel-based quick select menu might work equally well. Anything beyond 8 choices would be pushing it, but it would still be possible. That's not everything though. Each Unite Morph has four different sizes based on how large the player draws the symbol. This would be harder to represent with a menu, potentially be more error prone, and would obfuscate the screen a lot more than the present solution. On top of this, the way the Wonderliner can be blocked by certain obstacles or enemies means that the player has to be careful about which direction they draw the shapes in some scenarios. Someone who can consistently draw the hammer at every angle will have more options than someone who can only draw it facing northward. Personally, this is a nuance of the Wonderliner I'm not totally sold on, but it inarguably increases the skill ceiling of the game, something fans of this genre are no doubt interested in. Even after playing the game more than twice and coming to grips with the mechanics, all of this came as a revelation to me when I stopped to think about it. At the end of the day, the drawing system completely vindicates itself as a valid solution to the problems raised by the game's myriad weapons. While many weapons are given to players over the course of the campaign, most of the other moves need to be purchased at the wonderful mark between missions or earned by gradually leveling up the team. This is one of the game's more questionable design choices. The Stinger, Rising and Cyclone moves need to be unlocked individually for each weapon type, which shuts out most of the combo potential until well into the game. The small sense of progression this provides isn't worth the way it restricts the player on their first playthrough. Similarly, Unite Guts and Unite Spring aren't handed to the player at all, rather they have to be bought with a small amount of parts. As someone who's played many action games in the past, I immediately recognised the need to have these abilities and bought them, but I couldn't help but wonder what would happen if I hadn't, and I still don't understand why these are locked away behind a menu. 
I foresee two main scenarios here. In one, a player buys both of these abilities straight away, or maybe after one or two missions. In that case, it's no big deal. In the other, a player neglects to buy either of these abilities for a long time, and suffers a huge amount of frustration as a result. They may even quit the game because of it. Now you could say that not recognising the importance of such abilities deserves to be punished by a skill intensive game, and I wouldn't disagree. But it's one thing to give the player an ability and for them to neglect it, as opposed to asking them to spend a limited amount of money on a technique they've never had a chance to try. Even from the very first mission, Unite Guts is a very useful tool to have. Playing the entire game without either of these abilities would be extremely challenging, if not outright impossible. This is even more baffling since Unite Guts and Unite Spring both have upgraded versions which can be bought later. These could have easily replaced the basic versions as something for the player to purchase early on. Operation 1 establishes Unite Guts as a necessity with the hoedown enemies. Since Unite Guts counters every one of their attacks, this gets the player into the habit of pressing that button, so much so that it's hard to forget about that move by the time the first level is completed. Unite Spring, as a purely evasive manoeuvre, isn't strictly as necessary and as such there's no specific enemy to reinforce this move into the player's memory. The defensive measures are one of the first ways the wonderful 101 starts to reveal its complexity to the player. Not only are Unite Guts and Unite Spring great ways of dealing with enemy attacks, but certain enemies can also be countered by using general Unite Morphs, the most obvious being the sword which is used to reflect lasers, and the hammer which can block overhead projectiles. Less obvious is Unite Hand, which is immune to fire attacks, or Unite Whip, which can knock the spiked enemies off balance before they even get a chance to strike. Not content with this already large number of options, the Wonderful 101 gleefully steals a few other defensive mechanics which can be bought from the Wonderful Mart. Hero Time and Hero Counter work exactly the same way as two abilities in Bayonetta, as well as Ukemi, which returns from Beautiful Joe. This makes defense a more complicated prospect than it is in most action titles, since the player has so many options, but only a subsection of those options will work against any given attack. More options means more room for the player to make mistakes, but also a greater sense of satisfaction when things go well. Thankfully, the visual language is very clear, to the point where a player can rarely blame the game for choosing the wrong defensive action. Everything is telegraphed in some way, often with a long lead-in time, and it seems obvious that lasers or sharp attacks would puncture a giant pudding, whereas blunt attacks would be repelled. There's been a lot of attention to detail here to ensure that a perceptive player has enough information to make an appropriate decision at any given time. Something as simple as changing the colour of the Wonderliner to indicate which morph is about to be formed can provide vital information to the player depending on the situation. This extends down to small details. For example, when using a valve, a flash of colour will emit with every turn, letting the player know how close they are to finishing the action. Sometimes when an enemy spawns, a colour-coded ring will let the player know which weapon to use in order to steal the enemy's weapon once they're dead. Enemies will glow differently depending on whether or not they're about to fire a bomb or a laser. Even novelty boss fights have telltale signs about which direction the player needs to dodge. The game remains firm, but fair throughout. However, it is a bit much to expect players to pick up on such signs immediately when they start a battle. Boss fights suffer most from this, as most of them are one-off battles with unique enemy attack patterns or other single-use mechanics. While this type of design lends itself very easily to spectacle, resulting in some insanely over-the-top situations, it works considerably less well as a test of the player's skill, at least the first time around. Most of the fights test the player's competence at that particular boss rather than in a more general sense. On a first playthrough, this can leave the fights feeling a little anticlimactic. The boss will throw brand new situations at the player, the player will struggle to figure it all out, and eventually muddle through thanks to the continue system which resumes the fight exactly where it left off. It's worth noting that on multiple playthroughs all of this becomes less of an issue. In fact, on repeated playthroughs it's arguable the boss has become more enjoyable than they would have been had they been more homogenous. Most of the boss battles do share one thing in common, they're all bolstered by the surprisingly great orchestral soundtrack. Although during the general gameplay the music can become quite repetitive, it's put to very good use during bosses, and even during some of the general action or cheesy drama segments. There's two tracks which play during most boss fights, one which starts as the tables begin to turn on the enemy, and another which plays as the team begins to deliver the final blow. Although these are always the same, they fit well with the other music and the transition into them is almost always well-timed. 
This lends a fantastic sense of progression to each boss fight, giving an impression of the team overcoming the odds and pushing back a force which initially seemed to be stronger than themselves. If there's one boss which stands out from the others, it's Prince Vorkin. These fights feel like the most natural boss encounter the wonderful 101 has to offer, as they work not unlike a regular battle situation where the player can put their regular skills to the test. I believe this is the main reason why the Vorkin fight is repeated four times. After gaining an appreciation of the game's mechanics, I found these to be some of the best encounters in the entire game, but unfortunately this is also where the most noticeable frame rate drops appear. For the most part, the game runs at a fairly smooth 60 frames per second. Some short sequences take a hit in the frame rate, but usually not the core combat ones where it matters most. Vorkin, however, is an extended core combat sequence. The screen is also more cluttered than it is normally thanks to the large number of enemies, and some of Vorkin's attacks have comparatively short wind-ups. These quirks combined with the reduced frame rate make the Vorkin battles less enjoyable than they could have been. Although I praised the game a moment ago for its abundance of information which allows the player to make smart choices, there is one critical exception. Rankings occur at the end of each battle using more or less the same system as Beautiful Joe and Bayonetta. The player is ranked on combo, damage taken and time. Damage taken works perfectly fine, avoid all damage and you earn the maximum rank in it, simple enough. Combo and time run in opposition to each other however, usually the fastest way to kill an enemy will result in a lower combo and vice versa. This means if a player is looking to get a pure platinum ranking, they need to strike a balance between the two. To a large extent this is actually a good thing, because the player has to be good at both of those tasks, but the problem is each fight is balanced individually with no indication of what is expected of the player. If I was to ask you, how fast is fast, you wouldn't have an answer for me because it depends entirely on the context. Likewise, how much combo is enough? Well again, that depends, and the only way for a player to ensure they can strike the right balance on every fight is to play each mission repeatedly until they get a feel for what the game expects in each scenario. To use an example, imagine a battle is going well, the enemy is on low health, the player thinks they're completing it in good time, and they also think they have a good combo. What should they do next? The claw will build a lot of combo while doing comparatively little damage, whereas the hand will do a lot of damage, but comparatively little combo. There's no way for the player to know whether they should strive to build up the combo meter or go for maximum damage. They'll only find out at the end of the fight which decision was the correct one. For a game where even valves have health bars, this seems like a strange oversight. This problem would also have been simple to solve. The colour of the text on the combo meter could change to indicate what rank the player will receive for it, and a discrete timer could have been added to the HUD, perhaps as a depleting border around some other element. With those additions, the ranking system would still require top-notch skill, but would remove the guesswork from the equation. In fact, the rankings could have been rebalanced to expect even more from the player, since they'd have access to more information. On a first playthrough, a player will have to accept that they're not going to get great rankings all the time. This can be a little discouraging, so it's a good thing the game is such a blast to play otherwise. Even just the concept of a bunch of superheroes combining to form ridiculously huge weapons is satisfying to see in action. This inverts the usual action game concept of a single, powerful protagonist destroying hordes of weaker enemies to great effect. The battles are more inclined to focus on a small number of powerful enemies, with an emphasis on cautious counter-attacks rather than all-out offence. Most enemy attacks are powerful, hard to interrupt and have large hitboxes. As a result, it's rare that the team will ever get the opportunity to wail away on an enemy consistently until they die. This leads to exactly the kind of ebb and flow in battle which keeps the player on their toes, no matter how experienced they are. In stylish action titles like this, I've always found these kind of one-on-one -on -one encounters to be much more satisfying than battling weaker enemies. By my count, there's around 15 main enemy types which see regular use. This is discounting smaller enemy types which are usually just fodder for Unite Sword. The variety is good within those 15 types of enemies, but naturally since the game is about 12 hours long, those enemies will see a lot of repetitive use. This wasn't really an issue for me. As I said before, the way these enemies are constructed makes them interesting and even rewarding to fight repeatedly, but enemy placement patterns could have benefit from more variety. Even on the hardest difficulty, the game usually throws enemies of the same type at the player. This can be very difficult, of course, but not necessarily as interesting as a situation where different enemy types are combined. I understand in some circumstances this doesn't make much sense. For example, combining the turtle enemies with the fast raptor-like enemy seems like a recipe for disaster. Others make perfect sense though, the snake or scorpion enemies seem like they could slot into almost any engagement. 
If a battle spawned a snake and two other enemies, then when the snake jumps into the air, the player would have to focus on the other enemies while remembering to periodically dodge the snake's attacks. It almost seems like the kind of scenario those enemies were built for, yet they're usually fought by themselves or in pairs. Different enemy layouts would also force players to vary their morph attacks more often, since the enemies would be weak to different weapons. To be fair, this sounds like such an obvious suggestion that I'd be surprised if the development team hadn't tried it out already and simply found it didn't work well for whatever reason. But it seems to me that there are combinations that would make for very interesting combat scenarios which are totally absent from the main game, regardless of the difficulty level. In the grand scheme of things, some repetitive enemy layouts are a small issue considering how much the wonderful 101 gets right about its combat system. The weapons are varied in all the right ways. There's a world of difference between using the claws versus using the hammer, and the more specialised bomb and gun morphs complement the basic arsenal incredibly well. Most attacks are accompanied by a split second slowdown when they connect, making them a lot more satisfying. Equally as important as the gratifying attack animations is the punishment for mistakes, which usually comes with a harsh damage penalty, but more importantly knocks out members of the team. This stun mechanic forces the player on the defensive, thereby making it impossible to eat damage for the sake of killing an enemy more quickly. It's a clever way of basically forcing the player to fight correctly or waste their own time. Mapping the A button as the only attack button for the morphs seemed overly simplistic to me at first, but I came to realise that each of the four main face buttons provides an important function in battle. Even something as simple as holding the Y button to tighten the team's formation becomes important to the combat. The leader is the only one that can take damage which affects the ranking, but keeping the other wonderful ones out of the line of fire can prove important too, especially when looking to achieve a good ranking. The team attack and team morphs are both smartly mapped to the same button, and each adds another small but significant layer of strategy to the combat. On the shoulder buttons, Unite Guts, Spring and Tombstone round out the basic player's moveset to great effect. Not to mention the L button that can be used to speed up the Wonderliner, which can prove invaluable when the player wants to draw a large morph, and vice versa. Personally, I think one of the easiest ways to start judging a game like this is to examine its button layout, and see what could be removed, changed or added to make the process smoother or increase the complexity. With the wonderful 101, the controller is packed with useful and diverse skills which the player can easily perform at the press of one or two buttons. Given that almost nothing on the controller is wasted, and the enemy designs manage to capitalise on the game's more unique mechanics, I feel like the wonderful 101 has one of the best combat systems in any action title I've ever played. The initial concept for the game was for a bunch of Nintendo characters to work together, but the final version looks more like a culmination of director Hideki Kamiya's work. Wonder Red uses his fists and has a thin, flowing cape much like Beautiful Joe. Wonder Blue uses a sword, has silver hair and a cocky attitude making him quite similar to Dante. Wonder Pink has a very dominant personality and the same hairstyle as Bayonetta. Even the gameplay could be seen as an amalgamation of Kamiya's work, taking the symbol drawing from Okami, but applying it to an action game more in the vein of his other titles. Not only does the game become something greater than the sum of its parts, but it also feels distinct enough so as not to be a retread of Kamiya's previous games. For example, launching opponents into the air was one of the key satisfying features of Devil May Cry, and carried over into Kamiya's other titles. It's always been a relatively simple manoeuvre to pull off, something many players will do constantly over the course of the game. Launching an enemy in the wonderful 101 is a far more complicated task. First the enemy needs to be stunned, usually this is accomplished with a team attack, but this can prove troublesome in certain situations or for certain enemy types, so the player might need to use Unite Bomb or Unite Gun to make this happen. Once the enemy is stunned, then the player needs to get in close and switch to an appropriate Unite Morph, such as the hand or the sword. Once they have the weapon they want to use, they can launch the enemy, but to capitalise on this is quite hard. The enemy won't stay in the air for long simply by being hit with the same weapon, and the team is limited to one more launch while in the air, or a short juggle using Unite Gun. After this, the only way to slow the enemy's descent is using Unite Bomb, or using secondary morphs to keep the juggle going. When all of this is added together, we're talking about four or five different weapon switches, and several different moves which have to be done in a precise order to keep the enemy in the air. To execute a juggle in Devil May Cry, you held OR1, pressed triangle, and then tapped square. Despite how that may have come across, I'm not saying that to trivialise that game. Both systems are fantastic, and the Devil May Cry games have very complex combat systems with plenty of different techniques which the wonderful 101 lacks. But this illustrates the difference in how the action plays out. The combos are never quite as long or flashy looking as they are in Kamiya's other titles, but they're harder to pull off than the same manoeuvres in his other games. 
As far as I'm concerned though, this makes them even more impressive when you do manage to get it right. I felt more intimately connected to the things the team were doing than I would have otherwise. I'm probably not the right person to judge just how high the skill ceiling is on the Wonderful 101 compared to other stylish action titles, but I reckon it's quite high up there, especially on the hardest mode which removes the slow motion effect when morphing. The similarities to Kamiya's older games lead me to wonder if those characters would have made up some of the default cast of the Wonderful Ones if Platinum Games had the rights to them. Although that would be quite a novelty to see, I'm happier to see the game be its own entity rather than a pastiche. This allowed the team more creativity than they would have had otherwise. That hasn't stopped them from including many references to other works, the vast majority of which are thankfully very tastefully done, with an understanding that a reference isn't always the same thing as a joke. There's a fine line between an homage which comes from a good place and one which comes from a desire for a cheap laugh or a nostalgia grab. Rather than being in your face, many of them are very subtle, one of my favourites being Vork and Ship pulling a Zandatsu near the end of the game. These moments, littered throughout the wonderful 101, are mostly callbacks to Platinum, Nintendo or Kamiya's previous titles, so they end up feeling more like a wink to their own fans rather than an attempt to win people over by mentioning something else they might like. The Wonderful 101 has an immense amount of love poured into it, which is clear in the way these things play themselves out. It's both a parody of, and a tribute to, cheesy superhero shows and movies. Not only was the humour surprisingly good, but the overall story was executed a lot better than I expected, particularly the stories of Red and Blue. The interplay between these two is great, played effectively for both humour and drama. Some of the story sequences carry on a bit longer than they should, but others are very economical. The flashback in Chapter 6 acts as a catalyst for Blue's character growth, fleshes out the history of Major Nelson, and recontextualizes Red's actions earlier in the story, all while carrying an amusing retro sheen. At times, the backstories of the characters are elaborated upon while the game continues, which is a nice way to improve the flow. It's a little unfortunate that yellow, white and black get so little screen time, but considering how large the cast is and how many cutscenes there already are, it may be for the best that they're mostly limited to one-liners. My biggest complaint with the story would be Luca, who has a serious case of annoying child syndrome and an unfortunately large place in the plot towards the latter half. Considering the cartoon stylings, it's no surprise that some of the plot comes as, well, no surprise. You can practically see Vorkin's entire story from the moment he's introduced, but this isn't really a problem, and without saying too much, there's at least one very interesting twist before the end which goes some way towards making up for the otherwise predictable narrative. It's also satisfying to see the team grow over the course of the story, partially because of the weapons they unlock, but also because they're a surprisingly great cast. This was perhaps the most pleasant surprise of the entire game for me, how genuinely funny it could be at times. Wonder Pink could have maybe toned it down a little, and Immorta could have maybe toned it up a little, but by and large the voice cast have done a great job with their material. Wonder Red in particular gives a fantastic performance. I got the strong impression that he was either directed very well or took the time to really learn the script, because he sounds like he understands every single situation his character is placed in in the story, an unfortunately rare occurrence for voice acting in games. That deserves recognition. The dialogue suffers from the occasional awkward pause, which seems to stem from some unfortunately slow audio streaming. Thankfully the humour is left mostly intact, since the best jokes tend to come from the situations and events rather than the dialogue itself. Despite the great localization, the icing on the cake is the Japanese audio available from the menu for anyone who wants it. I have to respect the localization which puts a lot of effort in, but still makes the original available anyway, it's the best of both worlds. Naturally, the events of the story take the wonderful ones across the entire planet, which is the excuse for varied level design. Although, funnily enough, one of the most visually unique chapters also feels the most like padding because it robs the story of its momentum. The more varied visuals don't really kick in until after the first three chapters or so, which are quite similar aesthetically and start to wear out their welcome towards the end as a result. That said, they're very well put together regardless, and include a lot of attention to detail like flashing monitors and car alarms that go off when the vehicle sustains damage. Considering how zoomed out the camera is, these type of touches weren't really necessary, but they add a lot of vibrancy to the world, even if the player doesn't notice them consciously. They've played it fairly safe with the terrain in most encounters, which is probably for the best, but the space between the battle arenas can vary quite a lot. This is mainly thanks to the morphs, which can also be used to traverse the environment in several ways. Although this is always a linear experience, it feels very natural to climb around on things using the claw or fall underwater using the hammer. The Kagu Raga sections can require too much backtracking in order to find, but most of the other secrets are very well placed. In a lot of games, the level designers manage to make the secret areas almost as predictable as the main path, but even after a couple of playthroughs I was still finding new areas in the wonderful 101. 
Hiding something in a way which isn't obvious, but still feels fair when you work it out, is something any level designer should be proud of. Even despite some great efforts to mix things up in the second half, the fixed camera angle has a detrimental effect on the feel of the level, since it makes them seem more samey than they would otherwise. Unfortunately, I don't think there's any way this could have been avoided. Much like the drawing system, the camera of the Wonderful 101 is something I feel is easy to criticise on the surface, but works very well in a lot of ways. It has many benefits over the cameras in other action games, the first and most obvious one being that it frees up the right analogue stick because it's never controlled manually. Considering the right analogue stick is used for creating the morphs, the game simply couldn't function in its present form without a simple camera system like this. There are other benefits as well though. For example, the lock-on system is combined with the team attack since the game has basically been reduced to two dimensions, thus freeing up another button and removing a hasslesome gameplay element. Since there's no camera lock-on and the angle of the camera remains consistent at all times, then the directional input for the Wonderliner and the Stinger attacks can be done without the player having to worry about any sudden perspective changes. The isometric angle also has the obvious benefit of making the Wonderliner more or less match the shape the player inputs. This also avoids a key failing of many action titles where enemies will often disappear off-screen behind the camera. This results in either cheap attacks that come from nowhere, or, at best, an AI which becomes more passive when it's off-screen, something which can be exploited by the player to make the game easier. The wonderful 101 doesn't entirely avoid this issue as sometimes the arenas are larger than the viewpoint can manage, but for the most part it does an equally good job of keeping enemies on screen as most other action games, while providing a host of other benefits. The main problem is when the camera does fail it can be more frustrating than it would be otherwise since the player has nobody to blame but the game itself. Ideally it might have had another zoom level for some of the larger battles, but this may not have been possible without causing slowdown. It might seem ridiculous given the simplistic art style that the game might not be able to handle another level of zoom, but it's almost certainly more graphically intensive than it looks. Try not to think too hard about the second half of that sentence. The wonderful ones are all similar in shape and size, so they can be animated using the same skeletons, but every one of them has at least some aspect to their appearance which is totally unique. They're pretty low on the polygon count, but nonetheless that's a hundred unique character models which need to be loaded, controlled and rendered individually. This is all before factoring in anything else on the screen. Although it wasn't really necessary to present every single wonderful one as a completely unique character, I think it adds a lot to the game, so I'd say it was well worth whatever challenges it posed the team. Another great and more economical part of the visuals is the depth of field, which is intentionally exaggerated. This tricks the mind into making the game appear toy-like, since this kind of blurring would happen if the objects were very small, rather than if they were very large. This is a very simple effect, but it really helps to tie the visuals together. While the camera plays well with the core gameplay, it does considerably less well during some other sections. Scattered throughout the game are moments built around the Wii U gamepad. Initially, these don't seem too bad. The first one, where the player needs to use a combination to unlock a warehouse by lining it up on the main screen is hardly revolutionary, but it's an enjoyable little distraction, one which only lasts a few seconds. Later in that operation, the player has to open up the baseball stadium, and this is where the gamepad sections start to show their flaws more clearly. The camera on the gamepad is atrocious, since the right analogue stick needs to be saved for drawing morphs. Either the gyroscope is constantly turned on, making the view awkward to shift around properly, or the player needs to hold the OR button to go into a more traditional camera style. Neither of these are particularly good solutions, and these sections suffer heavily as a result. Some of them manage to be passable even with the camera issues. For example, the one where a ship fires lasers on the main screen, which the player has to avoid on the gamepad, is still quite good. Another one, which barely suffers from the camera, sees the player controlling a ship from the inside by running the wonderful ones over buttons. This one becomes especially great when enemies spawn inside the ship, effectively forcing the player to play two games at once. These are the exception rather than the rule though, overall the gamepad sections feel as forced and gimmicky as one might expect. As well as the gamepad sections, there's a barrage of special sequences which deviate from the core gameplay, most often the escape or shooter sections which Kamiya seems to have a soft spot for. These are done with varying degrees of success. At about 10 minutes long, and with no way to speed it up, one of the lengthiest occurs at the end of chapter 6. For me, this is easily one of the worst sections of the game. First and foremost, the camera is extremely misplaced for the entire duration, never showing far enough to the bottom right hand side of the screen because of the way it's angled, and it shows even less the further the player moves to the top left. This can result in enemies charging lasers from the bottom of the playfield which then hit the ship seemingly from nowhere. The point of view also doesn't give the player a very good indication of where the hitbox of the ship is compared to the incoming bullets. 
It's a shame because this area does have some good ideas going for it, such as obstacles which need to be removed using the Unite Morphs. A simple perspective change may have made this section far more enjoyable, although it would still suffer from the fact that it's a momentum-killing auto-scroller. More successful are the Punch-Out style boss fights, which don't have any camera issues to speak of and control as tightly as anyone could hope for. There's also a litany of other sections with varying degrees of success. This part in Chapter 5 works perfectly fine mechanically and even has a few clever little tricks, but it can feel very drawn out, especially on repeated playthroughs when the novelty is worn off. One of the interesting things about these diversions is that they continue to tie into the player's ranking. Towards the end of the game, after going through a lengthy boss section, the player is thrown into an escape sequence where they have to dodge laser beams. This lasts for about 30 seconds or so before the player is then expected to control two ships at the same time and dodge lasers with both of them. Again, this lasts about another 30 seconds. If you happen to get a game over during this section, then you can say goodbye to your pure platinum ranking for that operation. I couldn't help but feel these sections were a little unfair. It felt as though I had signed up to play the wonderful 101, but was sometimes being judged based on something else entirely. I have to recognise that these sections are technically part of the Wonderful 101, but they have nothing to do with mastering the core gameplay, which has by far the most effort put into it. The loading times also trample on the quest for pure Platinum rankings. Once a mission starts, it can go on for quite a while without any major loading screens, but the ones between operations are so bad that they need their own little VR training ground to keep the player from getting bored. If you want to reset a mission because you messed up an engagement, then you'll have to sit through the initial load time again. One of the most disappointing oversights is the unskippable transformation cutscene which occurs before every boss. As far as I can see, these are the only unskippable cutscenes in the game, but they happen to occur at points where the player is likely to restart if they're looking for a perfect rank. I'm not even convinced these sections are masking a hidden load time which might make them more understandable, because one of them occurs before it boots the player into a normal load screen. These kind of moments help to kill that drive for perfection which the game is otherwise very good at inspiring. In fact, no game in a very long time has tempted me to get good at it in the same way the wonderful 101 has. Some games feel like they click into place after a few hours of play, but with the wonderful 101 it felt more like a series of clicks since the combat has so many little quirks. Discovering a new strategy which helps trounce a previously troublesome enemy is extremely satisfying, all the more so because the game doesn't hold your hand. There's a lot of trust placed in the player to experiment and discover new things for themselves. This is why, in my warning at the start of this video, I mentioned I wasn't going to just spoil the story, but the gameplay too. Discovering all the neat little ins and outs was a very enjoyable experience for me. It's the kind of thing not many modern games provide. After finishing it for the first time, I was immediately left with the desire to play it again, learn more, and do better, so that's what I did. Hard mode unlocks after finishing the game once on normal, and for almost any other game I'd consider this a detriment. Usually I'll start up a new game on normal for the first time, but I absolutely sympathise with people who prefer to jump into hard straight away. I think, for the vast majority of games, it's not justifiable for the developer to lock hard mode away, but I'd consider the wonderful 101 to be one of the exceptions. Kamiya and Platinum games in general have a great attitude towards hard mode. The enemies don't just have more health or do more damage, they're presented in completely different layouts and sometimes exhibit smarter AI. This is why hard mode can't be available right from the start in the wonderful 101. It simply isn't balanced around the first time playthrough. As early as the first two operations, dragon and turtle enemies are thrown at the player, long before they would have Unite Hammer or Unite Claw. Now, it would be possible to beat those enemies without those weapons, but that's clearly not the intention. It would make for a frustrating and drawn out situation. There is a case to be made that hard mode should be available anyway in case the player loses their save file, but it's hardly the same issue it is in most other games. The same could be said for the quick time events. In many other games, these feel like a crutch placed in by the developer when the regular gameplay doesn't provide a more natural way to make the player character do something impressive. In the wonderful 101, the player is regularly doing impressive things by themselves, so the quick time events feel less forced. Learning from the mistakes with Bayonetta's lightning-fast quick-time events, which sometimes came from nowhere, every event in the Wonderful 101 is given a bit of lead time and a much longer time limit. It's clear they're not masquerading as a test of skill. Strangely, although the quick-time events are some of the least punishing I've ever seen, there's been a huge amount of amusing work put into their failure states which most players will never see. I also found the simple act of drawing shapes beforehand made me feel a bit more engaged in the action scenes, which I'm guessing was the point. There's more of these events than there probably should be, and in an ideal world they'd fit into the gameplay in a more natural way, 
but I'd be lying if I said I didn't enjoy many of them regardless, particularly during the boss fights and towards the end of the story. Both the quick time events and action cutscenes are very well directed throughout. They convey the action very well, and really contribute to the game towards the end where the scenarios become some of the most ridiculously over the top things ever depicted in a game. For me, one of the most interesting things about replaying the game was remembering that the story started with Wonder Red rescuing a few children on a school bus, and by the end it had escalated to, well if you don't know already maybe you should just play it. I have spoiled some stuff in this video, but I've omitted almost everything about the final operation, which really deserves to be experienced. It manages to be simultaneously one of the most enjoyable, climactic and funniest ending sequences I've ever experienced, and not something I'm ever likely to forget. Games have become more accessible in recent years, and by that I'm not just talking about the difficulty, what I really mean is it's easier to buy them. They're cheaper, they're on more devices, some of them are even free. Back when I was younger this wasn't the case, they all had a price tag which rarely dropped. Years ago if I bought a disappointing game but still wanted to play something I had to resort to an old favourite until I could get my hands on something else. That's what the wonderful 101 reminded me of. It's a game I felt I could go back to over and over again, whether just for an hour or for a whole day. Nowadays I have a huge number of games vying for my attention. Even as I record this I can look over to my left and see a stack of things I want to play, or I can right click on my taskbar and bring up an even longer list. I've played the wonderful 101 more than four times. Despite that, and in spite of all the other great games for me to play, in all likelihood I'm going to play it again very soon. As a kid I'd have considered the wonderful 101 the wisest investment I'd have made that year. The fact that I feel the exact same way as an adult should say a lot about its sheer quality and replay value. With how well fleshed out and imaginative the core gameplay of the wonderful 101 is, it could have easily coasted on just that and still been a pretty good game, even despite all its current flaws. It didn't necessarily have to have a good script, but it does. It didn't necessarily have to have a great soundtrack, but it does. It didn't necessarily have to be crammed full of hidden content and unlockables, but it is. Considering how positive this all is, I bet you're waiting for me to pull a certain adjective out of the bag to end this review on, but I've never been one for low hanging fruit. Instead I'll say the story is cool, the scenarios are brilliant, the action is amazing, the gameplay is superb, you can guess what you get when they unite up.